Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lucas Kello. I'm an associate professor of international relations at Oxford University, where I also serve as a co-director of the university's Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity. Uh, in this panel, we will discuss the mobilization of the legal system to counter nation-state cyber threats. This is an enduring and, in some regards, I think, intractable challenge owing to major obstacles in the legal system. One concerns international law. Nations disagree sometimes fundamentally about how laws and norms of restraint apply in this domain, which has produced a situation where in Western governments and democratic governments, broadly speaking, restrain their offensive activities far more than autocratic regimes and their proxies do. Another major challenge involves jurisdictional fragmentation. Nations that seek to apply their domestic penal codes to punish perpetrators routinely struggle to do so because they reside within foreign soil and often have an association with their parent government or uh, enjoy its protection. And this is certainly true, of course, of foreign state actors. So this afternoon, we have assembled a fantastic group of speakers representing three distinct perspectives on and efforts to address these obstacles. And the purpose of the discussion is not merely to identify limitations in the existing legal system, but also to showcase innovative efforts to overcome them. So we have with us on uh, your far left, Matthew Olson, who serves as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security in the US Department of Justice, where he leads the mission to combat terrorism, espionage, cybercrime, and other threats to national security. He brings 18 years of experience working at the DOJ as a career attorney and in a number of leadership positions. We also have next to him uh, Major Andrea Amendola, who brings to us almost two decades of experience working with the Special Operational Group of the Italian Carabinieri. His work has included, as we will learn, the development of strategies to counter online activity by Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. And we are also honored to have with us Helen Rochtla, who leads the Information Society Division at Estonia's Consumer Protection and Technical Regulatory Authority. Her division is responsible for maintaining public order on the internet and in media services. Vital responsibilities under the current conditions of intense war propaganda and online hate speech. Now, if I were a cyber criminal, even one tied to a nation state, and I'm not, I would not want to confront any of these individuals uh, and their institutions. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today. So first, I turn to Matt, who will discuss the Department of Justice's work within the US legal system to thwart foreign cyber threats. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you to my esteemed fellow colleagues. It's just a, it's a real privilege to be here uh, in Estonia uh, and to be part of this uh, extraordinary conference. Uh, and hats off to the, the folks who put this together. Um, this is a crucially important time uh, for us to gather uh, as our NATO, as NATO allies and other partners. Um, I know that the crisis in Ukraine is front of mind for all of us, um, in particular the inspiring bravery and the resilience of the Ukrainian people um, who are fighting to defend their families and their homes and their democracy. I, I know that's something that we're all thinking about. And it's also a profound reminder of the values that we all share in this room um, and our commitments and our shared responsibility as we discuss uh, the important policy and legal topics that have been front and center during this conference. So let me begin uh, by talking just a little bit about what I do at the Department of Justice. I'll talk briefly about that. Then I'll turn to touch on the nature of the cyber threat landscape as we see it in the United States. And then I'll, I'll talk briefly about some of the things that we're doing within the federal government, within the United States, to address the cyber threats uh, that we're facing. Um, so as many of you know, uh, the Department of Justice, where I work, is the lead a uh, federal agency for enforcing the laws of the United States. There are different parts to the Department of Justice. There's main justice, and then there's a number of, of field offices or U.S. attorney's offices. I lead a division of the Department of Justice 
the National Security Division. As you said, Lucas, we focus on counterterrorism, counterespionage, uh, cyber threats from nation states and other threats to our national security. Um, we also play a key role in bridging the law enforcement agencies within the United States and the intelligence community. So that's, um, we, we often work with uh, classified information and we figure out how we can use classified information, for example, in criminal prosecutions. And you know, as many of you know, as all of you know, actually, the, what we are seeing in terms of cyber threats are now among our greatest national security threats. Um, and our job in the National Security Division is to go after nation state actors who carry out malicious cyber activity uh, inside the United States. And this is an area of increasing complexity. Um, let me talk just a little bit about the nature of uh, the cyber threat landscape that we see. Um, you know, there's just a number of ways in which nation states in particular, and when we talk about the, our adversaries, we really are talking about four significant adversaries, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Um, and in various ways, these, these nation states act to steal our technology. Um, they carry out economic espionage to steal trade secrets from uh, technology companies, for example. They amass personal information about US citizens to build databases uh, uh, about um, our citizens. They seek to uh, influence either uh, covertly or even overtly in a malign way our democratic processes. Um, and then through uh, various cyber means, they seek to hold our critical infrastructure uh, at risk to either disruptive or even destructive attacks. Um, let me just give you a few examples um, of what I'm talking about. And again, these are gonna be examples that are gonna be quite familiar to, to folks in this room. Um, for one, last year we had the government of China engaging in a malicious cyber campaign that exploited vulnerabilities in the Microsoft Exchange servers um, in order to compromise uh, victims. It was a massive operation. It resulted in significant costs uh, for primarily private sector uh, victims. Uh, Iranian government actors uh, have an, interfered with, with uh, critical infrastructure systems on, on a broad range of victims within the United States. And then North Korea, uh, North Korean government actors have robbed cri cryptocurrency exchanges and central banks, stealing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that uh, are used in some ways to evade sanctions and to support their weapons programs. Um, so look, at, at DOJ, like uh, across the federal government and across uh, our out with our allies as well, we are particularly focused on Russia uh, for, for very good reason. Um, you take, for example, the recent cyber attack that Russia carried out again in Europe uh, against satellite internet uh, infrastructure, uh, Viasat, the Viasat uh, attack. Um, as Russian troops were preparing to move into Ukraine in the early morning hours of February 24th, Satellite internet connections are, uh, were suddenly disrupted in Ukraine. This attack by Russia uh, against the satellite ground systems, the infrastructure plunged tens of thousands of people in, in Europe, across Europe, into internet darkness. Uh, it hit part of the Ukrainian defenses. A month later, uh, into March, thousands of people in Europe were still uh, reportedly offline, and that included 2,000 wind turbines in Germany. So this is just one of the latest examples of how Russia has used um, its cyber capabilities to support its invasion of Ukraine. Um, Russia's solar winds attack uh, last year, um, carried out by their intelligence service, by the SVR, uh, attacked and compromised tens of thousands of networks globally, um, including in the United States. We're very, we're very concerned about the attack and the effect on US government systems, part of a massive spying campaign. So, then you go back to the most costly uh, cyber attack in history, the 2017 NotPetya attack, um, carried out by the Russian uh, military intelligence, the GRU. Um, that, in, in, in fact, was a destructive attack. So this is a pattern by the Russian government. And we are bracing in the United States for more attacks. Uh, the White House recently reiterated the warning uh, that there could be potentially Russian uh, actors who would carry out malicious cyber activity, um, including as a response to the unprecedented economic costs uh, we've imposed on Russia alongside our allies and partners. So um, what are we doing about this? What are we doing about this cyber uh, la threat landscape and particularly uh, when it comes to Russia? And, and I think you know, our, our general strategy is to use all of the legal tools in our, in our arsenal. 
Um, one of our core authorities, of course, is the enforcement of our criminal laws through investigation and prosecution. Um, we believe it's essential that we hold criminal actors accountable, um, and it's also one way that we can publicly inform uh, private companies and, and the general public about the nature of the threats we face. So this past March, the Department of Justice and, and my division announced charges that we had returned against four Russian nationals associated with the Russian government uh, for their involvement in two campaigns that targeted critical infrastructure, not just in the United States, but globally, um, in the energy sector between 2012 and 2018. Um, one of those cases charged a Russian national who was a member of a Russian military research institute with a multi-year effort to hack into industrial control systems, companies overseas and in the United States, um, and the goal was to physically damage the safety functions of these systems. Um, in another case, we charged uh, three Russian intelligence officers with targeting software and hardware control systems of companies in the energy sector uh, to gain surreptitious and persistent access to those systems. So this is the kind of activity that really vividly demonstrates uh, both the capability and the intent of Russian government actors. They have global reach and ambition. Um, and that's one benefit of these indictments, these public charges. But it's not the only one, because uh, in these cases, we haven't arrested anyone to date. But that doesn't mean we won't. We have long memories, um, and we are patient. Uh, and that includes not just the Department of Justice, but our primary investigative agency, the FBI. So beyond what we do when it comes to criminal charges, um, we also are looking to be proactive. Um, we know that prosecutions are not the only thing that we can do at the Department of Justice, and in fact, we are looking for ways to actually prevent these attacks before they occur. Um, and so even when an arrest may be unlikely, um, we, prior we prioritize the disruption of criminal cyber activity. So recently, we have taken a more proactive approach. Um, and let me give you a couple examples. This, this goes back um, uh, some time to the Microsoft Exchange server attack uh, of last year, where, um, it, where, as I mentioned, we had zero day vulnerabilities uh, by a Chinese government hacking group that, that was sponsored by the Ministry uh, of State Security. Um, and through these vulnerabilities, the, the, the group, the Hafnium actors, were able to place <coughs> web shells on mail servers, allowed for access to the content of email, um, as well as the ability to place additional malicious files, effectively giving Chinese intelligence the ability to spy on a wide range of victims, universities, law firms, think tanks, non-government organizations. So private sector mitigation had some benefit, but nearly a month after these vulnerabilities were discovered, there were still hundreds of these web shells still on, on US servers. Um, so running this software. So, with court approval in April of 2021 of last year, um, we were able to conduct an operation that actually removed uh, the remaining half, uh, half names of uh, web shells. Um, these could have been used to maintain access, and, and this was, an, again, an authorized court order that gave us the ability to do this. Um, a similar, a similar, uh, uh, a similar uh, uh, activity that we undertook um, just a few weeks ago involved uh, malware known as Cyclops Blink. And this is something that, uh, an attack that the Russian intel military intelligence service, the GRU, had carried out. Um, we had identified this malware that was connected to the GRU, um, and it had established uh, a series of, of botnets. Um, uh, and we were able to, again, use our court-authorized search and seizure authority to remove the ability of the command and control layer to, uh, to manage this botnet. Again, it's sort of a traditional search and seizure authority that you can use in a regular criminal case, and we were able to use it to, as, a, as an authority to remove the instrumentalities of that crime, that is, the malicious code. Uh, so that eliminated the ability of this command and control layer to control the botnet. It's just a good example of how we're looking to leverage the legal tools that we have in new ways. So these are traditional legal tools that we are leveraging in new ways in the cyber context to have real impact in an operational way. So um, we have additional tools uh, that we also can rely on uh, in this all tools approach. We look to forfeiture. Um, we also, through the FBI, work with our partners to provide targeted intelligence to the private sector to give them the information they need. Sometimes we declassify classified information 
Um, and we recognize that you know, this is not the only set of tools that we have, that law enforcement is a part of a broader government-wide effort. Um, so we look to see us as a force multiplier to use our unique authorities along with Treasury Department and, and State Department um, and Defense Department, all of our partners in the federal government who have their own authorities that we can use. Um, so look, I, I, I think that's probably enough for now in terms of the, the way in which the Department of Justice is pr providing support and coordination with our partners in, in the federal government as, long, as well as with our partners uh, in, in other countries and our allies. Um, it, this really kind of just scratches the surface and I know we'll have some questions um, to, to respond to. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this hearing and I look forward to hearing to our other panelists. So thank you. So uh, thank you, Matt, for those very informative comments. So uh, now, in, to me, some of what you said reflects a recognition of the limitations mm. in the existing legal system, at least as it's been applied before, right? Because you said, you know, there's been a lot of movements, and, and, and we've seen this, um, I think, especially after the DNC hacking in 2016, to indict and attempt to prosecute um, individuals uh, uh, involved in these kinds of activities residing abroad. But you also uh, began to outline for us a more proactive approach, right? And that to me, again, seems to suggest that there's a recognition of limitations with mm -hmm. indictments. And what's interesting, um, that uh, something that you said that really caught my eye is this notion that you're interested in preventing offense activity. So that to me is really interesting because in, in, in my research, for example, I'm interested in how legal doctrine uh, interacts with strategic doctrine. And by speaking of prevention, you're starting to invoke questions about uh, deterrence and conflict prevention and so forth. So uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how in your office you have uh, tried to align the work that you do in terms of indictments and prosecutions and, and proactive activity, aligning that with uh, diplomatic efforts um, with the Department of State, for example. Yeah, th thank you for that question. And, and it is the case that, in, 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 and I think that, that we are one part of a broader ecosystem and there are limitations to what we can do based on our ability to prosecute, investigate and prosecute uh, individuals who break the law, uh, break our, violate our criminal laws. And so we are always looking for ways, obviously, just like we've learned from the counterterrorism fight, the goal really is to prevent uh, these acts from taking place to begin with, right? Not just to investigate and prosecute them when they, when they occur. Um, so we work very closely with the State Department, to your question, Lucas. So, and, and I'll give you, a, 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 and as well as with the Defense Department and their capabilities and the Treasury Department, which I also mentioned, I'll give you an example from last year, I mentioned the solar winds attack that was carried out by Russian intelligence. Um, in April of last year, the president announced uh, a series of actions uh, to sanction uh, Russian actors in connection with that. Uh, sanctions uh, meaning that you know no that U.S. companies cannot do business or cannot interact with those sanctioned entities, and it included six technology companies in Russia that supported the work of the intelligence services. Um, in, in addition to announcing those sanctions, and, and I should say, what we do in the Justice Department is that we enforce those sanctions. So Treasury and State have the authority to impose the sanctions, to name the sanctioned entities. The Justice Department then can prosecute any entity, any individual or company that violates those sanctions by doing business with those sanctioned companies. Obviously, this is something that we're doing right now with respect to Russian oligarchs. Um, in addition, at the same time, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security uh, 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 named uh, this as a Russian attack and, and gave uh, warnings and advice to the private sector on how to, how to remediate. So I think the solar winds attack and the way we responded to it sort of starts to give a picture of a series of actions that different legal authorities allow different departments to take that start to build uh, knowledge, resilience, um, and prevention and deterrence into a, a broader strategy. 
Yeah, yeah it, it really is important, I think, also to, to emphasize the more proactive approach that you've taken, because l let's be honest about it. If I were a Russian um, a state or private uh, a criminal based inside Russia, and I were indicted by your office, I very well might print that out and hang it on my wall as a mark of distinction. Right? But now with the more proactive approach and also with the closer coordination with the Department of State and um, pursuing other diplomatic avenues, well, then the world starts to close in on me Correct. a bit more. Correct. Right. Okay. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, uh, next, we will turn to Andrea, who will discuss the uh, Italian police forces' efforts to combat extremist exploitation of the internet. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I have to say that it would be easier for me to face a group of terrorists than uh, this audience. So it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not something I'm used to. I'll try to do my best. I'll, um, uh, I'll uh, deal with uh, non-state violent actors as protection leaders, uh, terrorist organizations, terrorists in general, because this has been my work for the last 20 years, as uh, Lucas uh, mentioned. And um, essentially, the uh, internet was a game changer for terrorism because it allowed terrorist organizations to uh, control channels of distribution of propaganda, of ideology. And this was something that uh, they couldn't do before because they had to rely on traditional media that they couldn't control. So uh, I'll try to uh, provide you with an overview of how terrorists uh, has managed to uh, find new opportunities and how the legal tools that are available to governments and states were developed uh, in, um, in association with iterations of the, uh, innovations by terrorist organizations and counter innovations by governments and security agencies. So let's start from uh, the beginning, uh, the, the first iteration of this uh, innovation, counter innovation, that is the centralized control. So at the beginning, the uh, terrorist organizations uh, managed to uh, exploit the internet as a new channel, challenge for, uh, channel for, uh, for radicalization using a forum, terrorist forum. This was done by Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2003, more or less, when they uh, established forum and we, uh, that they directly controlled. These forms were important not only because they uh, were used to, uh, as a, uh, to publish propaganda, so to, uh, to spread the, their uh, radical and extremist ideologies, but also because they allowed uh, uh, terrorist organizations to move uh, communities from the physical world to the virtual world. So uh, before the, uh, the uh, obviously the, the, the other, the other uh, there are two pillars in the radicalization. One is ideology, the, the other are networks. So it's important face-to-face -face, uh, relations. Uh, now it became uh, increasingly more difficult for, uh, for Al-Qaeda to have this face-to-face uh, -face interaction in phys the physical world after 2001. So they managed to move these iteration, interactions with uh, their supporters from the physical to the virtual world. So in these forums, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they w were important for radicalizations, and after radicalization, they also provide services like uh, terrorist training and terrorist uh, recruiting. So uh, they were uh, essentially in this, uh, they were like conveyor belt in which supporters entered as just like a supported and uh, were and produced terrorists. Now, what was the uh, legal response to this, uh, to this challenge? So the new challenge, because before 2001, essentially radicalization occur, occurred in the physical world. The, the, uh, was the application of the uh, traditional uh, criminal law to this new reality. Obviously, this, uh, this uh, criminal law had to be adapted to, the, to this new challenge. For example, training uh, was uh, before, uh, before the internet was conducted essentially face-to-face. Uh, -face. While in the internet, for example, uh, uh, the trainer can just put, uh, the upload uh, terrorist manual and uh, videos, and then the trainees can download them and train on their own. So the, the legislation had to be adapted to a different kind of uh, uh, criminal conduct. 
Uh, here you can see, you can see the, uh, an operation we conducted in Rome, uh, my team conducted in Rome against uh, two people uh, to, that run and manage the uh, jihadi website that was used also to recruit people in 2012, 2013. And uh, through the forum, they managed to uh, put in contact uh, uh, volunteers for Syria with uh, Jabhat al-Nusra that was uh, essentially an offshot of al-Qaeda in Iraq at that time. So the second uh, uh, iteration of this uh, cycle of innovation, counter-innovation, was the decentralization. Because it was increasingly difficult for terrorist organizations to manage directly forums. So they essentially, uh, this was ISIS uh, in uh, 2014 more or less, they asked their supporter uh, their supporters to establish uh, networks uh, exploiting the rising uh, use of uh, social media. And uh, to, they use these networks to spread uh, propaganda and for radicalization. So uh, in, in, with this new threat, the traditional response was useless because it was impossible to investigate all these people. We are uh, talking about uh, around 50,000 uh, Al-Qaeda supporters, ISIS supporters. Each one were actively involved in this operation of using the internet for, uh, for terrorist purposes. So uh, what, what was the response uh, in, um, let's say, starting in 2015, uh, 2016? The response was to involve uh, internet companies. So internet companies that managed this platform that was abused by terrorists. In this case, uh, the, uh, essentially they used uh, social media and uh, um, uh, I mean, the, the EU, I'm talking also about Europol that had a, a leading role in this uh, encounter, in this phenomenon. They asked uh, uh, these companies to take responsibilities for what was published in their platforms. So initially, they don't want to do that because uh, for them, uh, the responsibility was, uh, uh, was not theirs, but where the, use, the users were responsible for, for, uh, for the content published. But especially when uh, ISIS started publishing videos of uh, behaving, if you remember, uh, of uh, American and British citizens, then they decided to uh, cooperate with, uh, with, this, uh, with the security agencies. So uh, essentially, the, the system worked like that. Uh, the uh, states, including Italy, established uh, uh, internal referral units that, were, uh, that essentially tried to uh, identify material, uh, material and uh, accounts that were used to spread terrorist propaganda. The, uh, this IRU, uh, um, they referred this, uh, this content to the platform that removed them. Uh, now, this was a voluntary cooperation by internet companies, but in 2021, uh, the EU issued the regulation in which this uh, cooperation is now mandatory. So, uh, uh, internet companies are required to remove uh, terrorist content, to close uh, accounts used by terrorists uh, in one hour after being reported. So, it's very short time, very short time. So, at the beginning it was voluntary, now it was... Uh, uh, so, in this case, you see, you see that uh, the response to this kind of use of the internet was uh, shifted from uh, the, the essentially uh, investigating, arresting, and prosecuting people uh, to uh, preventing people, fr from preventing people, uh, terrorists, from exploiting the internet. Uh, in the third phase, that uh, uh, it's the new one, let's say so, in, it's the emerging threat is the exploitation of this free speech. So uh, uh, beforehand, I, I mentioned the fact that terrorists uh, uh, use the forum or uh, uh, social media to spread and publish propaganda, terrorist propaganda. That was clearly terrorist. I mean, it was be behaving, videos of behaving, videos of terrorist attacks, videos of inciting people uh, to, to commit terrorist attacks in, in Western countries. So it was, uh, it was um, clearly terrorist material and illegal material. But anyway, uh, in, in, uh, in the same years, some, uh, some people uh, started to exploit uh, freedom of speech in our society to, uh, to uh, spread uh, extremist ideologies without inciting clearly 
to, uh, to terrorists. So in this case, they wanted to avoid being labeled as terrorists, uh, at least legally, but they obtained the same results. So they used these platforms uh, to radicalize people. And uh, for example, in, in Italy, we, uh, we, we arrested uh, uh, an important uh, Islamist preacher that had established in, uh, in, um, in 2015, more or less, a website which had, uh, a, on surface, was not illegal, but was used then in a, a deeper, at a deeper level to recruit uh, people for, for the jihad in, uh, in Syria and Iraq. Now, the problem with the, the exploitation of the free speech for extremism, to spread extremism, is that uh, the traditional legal tool, criminal legal tool, cannot be used because uh, they, uh, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to uh, criminalize uh, extremism because it's difficult to define, to de give a definition of extremism. And uh, obviously, there is the danger of uh, uh, harming one of the uh, fundamental rights in our societies, so the freedom of speech. However, these extremist networks represent a serious threat, because from uh, these networks uh, periodically emerge uh, threats, terrorists. So it's not like before in which uh, terrorists produce extremism, in uh, like uh, it was the, 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 the aims of uh, the aim of uh, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, now terrorism is produced by extremism. So uh, beforehand, we had uh, a top-down approach in which radicalization was top-down. Now radicalization is bottom-up, so it, uh, terrorism emerges from. Uh, so if, for example, we had uh, uh, in, in Italy, we had uh, one of these uh, people that uh, uh, shot at immigrants. In, in, it was uh, uh, after reading material in the internet and social media that uh, uh, consider uh, immigrants as, a, as a, a, a threat for Italy, as a threat, and then uh, try to kill them in, uh, in 2018. And this uh, person, that was Luca Traini, was a role model for, uh, for example, the, the Christ Church shooter in New Zealand, but also from the recent uh, responsible uh, of shooting in, in Texas. So. Uh, and also, these networks produce, produce also different kinds of security threats, for example, related to the uh, recruiting of mercenaries for uh, uh, the Donbass. So uh, in, in 2018, we conducted an investigation in which, uh, at the end of this investigation, we arrested six people for uh, being mercenaries and uh, for fighting with Russians in, Dom in Donbass. And uh, apart from uh, uh, that, this was a non-terrorist threat. But always it, it, it can produce, and there is a, a raising consciousness that these people, when returning to Italy, may represent also a security threat. And these people also use the uh, internet to, uh, to spread uh, the Russian narrative on the conflict. Uh, now, what is the response to this kind of uh, presence of uh, virtual, uh, virtual community? The response was to use the, the uh, internet companies uh, term, uh, terms of services against in these networks. We couldn't have, uh, we cannot have a legal, uh, I mean, a criminalization of extremists because of the danger of censorship. And so we, uh, we, uh, uh, we used the, the terms uh, of services I mentioned, I copied one in, uh, in the slide that uh, forbids the use of the platforms to spread hatred towards other groups in order to, uh, to, uh, and, uh, to, collaborate, to cooperate with the internet companies and close uh, accounts and uh, delete content that are not illegal, but extremist anyway. So you, see, you can see there an operation conducted by uh, Europol and other countries in which they used the term of services, they reported uh, legal but extremist accounts to the internet companies, I mean the police, this internet referral union, and this content and these accounts were closed and removed. So just to sum up, uh, I've, uh, I, I try to, uh, to, uh, to provide you with, a, with an overview of how the, the legislation, the legal tool developed uh, uh, in, in cycles of innovations and counter-innovation. 
And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it all started with the application of criminal law, then it shifted to a more preventative regulation, and then to the, uh, to the use of the term of services, which is not a public law, strictly speaking, against extremism. Uh, as I, uh, there are probably, uh, just to, to conclude my presentation, three trends that can be identified in these uh, 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 I mean, uh, cycles. That is the, the shift from uh, national legislation to international legislation, the shift fr uh, from uh, prosecution to prevention, and the shift for, from uh, uh, I mean, an institutional response based on security agencies to the involvement of uh, private companies and also, I would mention, the civil society. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for those comments. Now, I want to take the opportunity of having someone with your extraordinary experience and understanding of institutions to ask you a question about uh, organizational reform. Because um, much of what you said reminded me of a common distinction within the academic literature on governmental reform between the effectiveness of an institution, which denotes its ability to achieve its stated objectives, and the institution's robustness, which is about um, evolving, changing the institution so that it can address new objectives that it was not originally designed to achieve. And um, in this regard, I think it's notable that you said that uh, innovation often happens from the bottom up. This is certainly true, as you pointed out in the presentation in the second phase, Right, of the, on the criminal side of the divide with um, the decentralization that happens. So I'm interested in knowing uh, more about how your own organization in the police force, which is traditionally hierarchical, right. Right, a top-down organization, and others like it, were able to innovate right, um, in, without necessarily inverting the hierarchy. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting response. It was a, a very interesting in way to understand the innovator. I mentioned another aspect. I'm interested in intelligence because I, I just... The, the problem is that, obviously, uh, you know, in general, talking about management, uh, organizational management, uh, decentralized organizations are more able to innovate than centralized and hierarchical organizations. So it's not easy for the police as an institution, and especially, I think, a military institution to, to innovate, because, uh, uh, I mean, we, we more tend to be on the tradition uh, side. I mean, we, we more rely on tradition. We, we are, especially institutions, the public institutions uh, are uh, fears of uh, losing the appeal they have on uh, public opinion if they innovate, if they change. So this is a, an aspect. Uh, I think that uh, uh, terrorist organizations were incredibly good at innovating uh, because of this uh, uh, the, the bottom-up, I mean, uh, uh, innovation. So that it was it wasn't them, it wasn't a terrorist organization that decided to use uh, a social media platform. Their supporters. Uh, when uh, started to use them. And then they, this organization accepted and exploited this innovation that was introduced by supporters. So how can we counter this, uh, uh, this, uh, this ability to innovate? I think that we have been very good at innovating, but a little bit slow. So uh, I think that, in general, it's important uh, to anticipate these terrorist innovations. They anticipate opportunities. For example, a few days ago, I was in uh, The Hague and talked about uh, at a Czech web meeting, the meeting of Europol, and it, we must start thinking about how terrorists could exploit the metaverse, how could exploit blockchain technology, how could exploit, uh, um, uh, for example, decentralized platforms before they really start using 
them. Because, for example, social media took four years in order to, uh, to respond in an effective way. So we, analysis and forecast is very important. And the other factor that is important for institution, public institution, is the, uh, the, the private, uh, we mentioned that, public-private uh, cooperation, and also the cooperation with the, the academic world that must be developed. So it's difficult, it, 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 I mean, the institution must develop it within the organization process of innovation, but they also can import them from the outside. So that's an interesting idea. If you can't necessarily invert the hierarchy in order to spur innovation, you can at least branch out horizontally rather than vertically. Yeah, so. I mean, this is, uh, in general, in, uh, in the business yeah. world, is uh, one dogma that is the centralized organization are more able to innovate that's an, than hierarchical ones. So I think the, the challenge implied in my question applies to um, the organizations of our other two speakers. Mm -hmm. It may be a question that we will return to uh, later. Uh, but next, uh, I want to turn to oh, Helen, sorry. who will discuss measures to combat war propaganda uh, and hate speech in Estonia emanating largely from across the border to the east, I imagine. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Uh, we are definitely not as experienced as, as my co-panelists, but I would try to give you a short overview of what we have done regarding the Russian uh, uh, war propaganda and hate speech online. But firstly, I would like to uh, share with you how propaganda works. Um, propaganda is aimed to cause confusion, panic and fear and shape people's opinion about the enemy. Uh, this may be done by simple name calling. The most uh, well-known Russian narratives in Ukraine have been that Ukrainians are Russophobes, fascists and Nazis. Uh, Russians have been scared with the thought that Ukraine, but uh, going further, the whole world, Western world is planning to attack Russia. NATO's continued presence in Eastern Europe is a clear evidence of this, that is in the opinion of Russia, of course. And Russia must stand uh, for its uh, geopolitical interest in the region. Russia needs to protect ethnic Russians from discrimination and in foreign countries, like in Ukraine, but the same narrative has been used in regard to Baltic states. And tons of fake news have been produced to illustrate this narrative. Uh, therefore, to protect Russia, uh, Russia's interests uh, and uh, fellow Russians living in Ukraine, it is important to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Now, here's a great example how uh, symbols are used in propaganda. Uh, this poster was published in Crimea prior to Crimean status referendum in March 2014. It uh, carries an easy and understandable message. Either you uh, see your bright future with Russia, or you support the Nazis, that being Ukrainian government. Propaganda messages need to be kept simple. They are uh, to attract masses. Uh, to many of you, this poster might not affect your decision making, but I think we need to understand that something like this is never the me first propaganda message. Before that, it's necessary to prepare our audience, that is to spread this, this information uh, on al alleged discrimination of ethnic Russians, but uh, also undermine the local government. In case of Ukraine and also many other former Soviet republics, slow but increasingly more aggressive information operations have taken place since the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, Kremlin emphasizes on a crucial role of information and psychological operations in spread of uh, confusion of uh, in the spread of. Uh, uh, in regard to preparation and uh, conduct of military actions. Uh, the Gerasimov Doctrine is named after the Chief of General Staff of Russian uh, Armed Forces, Val Valery Gerasimov, and became widely known in 2013 when he published his article in which he emphasizes the importance of non-military components of uh, modern warfare, estimating the ratio of non-military measures against the military to be four to one. Even the chief editor of Russia Today, Margarita Simonyan, has publicly recognized state-owned or controlled media being part of Russia's weapon arsenal. 
So the question rises, should such, such media outlets, uh, uh, freedom of express, expression be unconditionally uh, respected? And should freedom to receive information from these sources be guaranteed? Of course, freedom of expression still needs to be respected. But it's important to remember that with every res freedom comes responsibility. Freedom of expression must, must be exercised responsibly, respecting the rights of others. It is important to understand that at the moment, the same values we so highly cherish, democracy <coughs> and freedom of spe speech, are actually used as, wep as weapon ag weapons against us. We need to preserve and protect democracy against Russia's destructive policy. Mm. Freedom of expression should not be unconditionally respected in case national security, public safety and rights of others are at risk. And of course, it is important to understand that uh, every restriction still needs to be lawful, necessary and proportionate. Uh, but spreading war propaganda is clearly prohibited by International Convention of Civil and Political Rights adopted by the UN. European Union Council framework decision uh, on combating certain forms of expression on racism and xenophobia by means of criminal law clearly states that member states need to criminalize public inciting to violence and hatred direct against, directed against group of person or a person defined by preference to race, color, religion, descent, or nation, or ethnic origin. In Estonia, both spreading war propaganda and incitement to hatred are criminalized. But until February this year, we were extremely liberal. We never before restricted access based on the content of media service. We believed, we believed in people's media literacy skills even in the first of times. Now, speaking of the worst of times, here you can see uh, events from 2007 that took place in Tallinn. Uh, we called it Bronze Nights or April Unrest. Estonian government has decided to relocate Soviet World War II memorial from the city center to the, def to the Defense Forces Cemetery in Tallinn. The decision was also widely broadcasted in Russian media, often in a hostile manner accusing Estonians of being Russophobic and discriminating against the Russians community in Estonia. We did not restrict any ac access to any websites or media or web or TV channels before, during or after these events. Although it was clear that Russian media ch channels by no means eased the tensions. On the contrary, according to Estonian international security services, Russian media help escalating the events. This experience from 2007 made us more cautious this time around. Knowing how large Russian-speaking minority in Estonia is and how many of them consume Kremlin propaganda on a daily basis, we realized that the events of 2007 might repeat themselves. So what did we actually do? Uh, to target Russian propaganda. Uh, we temporarily restricted access to the seven TV channels. This was done by issuing precept to electronic communication undertakings, retransmitting those TV channels. Uh, you may ask why for 12 months? Uh, well, our uh, reasoning behind that was that uh, it can be assumed that the acute period of Russia's attack against Ukraine and the active cognitive war that might follow might take at least 12 months, but this might be prolonged. Now about the legal grounds. Legal grounds for the, our decision came from the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. The directive states as a principle that the reception and retransmission of media services shall not be restricted. However, member states may, in, uh, may provisionally derogate from this principle in case the media service presents a serious or grave risk to public security, including the safeguarding of national security and defense. Taking into account the significant Russian-speaking minority in Estonia and the increasing aggressive propaganda spread by channels in question, we found that these channels present a serious and grave risk to public security. 
but besides TV channels available through television, there were many websites which made it possible to, to watch TV broadcasting uh, and uh, already restricted under the audiovisual media services. And there also were some news portals inciting hatred and spreading war propaganda. Therefore, we needed to act, uh, restrict access to websites. This was done by issuing precept to internet service providers to block respective domains, domain names in domain servers. Again, we had not, uh, the websites had not been block blocked permanently, but the restrictions are set for 12 months. Uh, legal grounds for these decisions came from domestic law. As I previously mentioned, both spreading pro-propaganda and incitement of, incitement of hatred are criminalized in Estonia. In, ad in addition, supporting and justifying a cri international crime with symbols such as Z or V letters or the St. George's ribbon, for example, are criminalized in Estonia. Those amendments, the last months, uh, entered into force in the April of this year. And as, as we are responsible for the public order in internet, uh, it was our duty to, to make sure that those websites are blocked in Estonia. Now about the impact of these, our decisions. It is still early days to talk about long-term impact of our decisions, but it, at least we can see some positive outcomes. We can see that the credibility of Russian media has fallen and daily share of our Russian language public broadcasting channel has increased significantly. Of course, it would be naive from me to say that this is solely the result of our decisions. The beginning of war and the seamless disinformation published in Russian channels has helped us to, has helped to open the eyes of some keen followers. As a national regulatory authority of audio visual, visual media services, we can also say that uh, there is a noticeable increase among our media service providers to start new Russian language channels in Estonia. Uh, but I think we need to bear in mind that banning something is never the solely a good, so, uh, good solution in a long-term view. There are hundreds of TV channels and thousands of websites. We will never be able to effective, effectively ban them all. Thus, we need to get the, to the roots of the problem and work on media literacy skills. In addition, I think we need to offer alternative uh, content to Russian speakers. Uh, in, and in conclusion, I think it's important to understand that uh, the same values, as I already said, democracy and freedom of expression are being used against us as weapons right now. And uh, I think it's crucial for NATO and all the members of the alliance to draw appropriate conclusions from the ongoing conflict in Europe, which has shown that, uh, to us the importance of uh, information warfare. And uh, it is important to input, uh, to improve, improve our level of preparedness to respond to the challenges of the 21st century warfare. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen. So the establishment of ETV2 strikes me as one of those proactive kind of measures that uh, of the kind, uh, well, a very different kind of proactive measure than the ones Matt were, uh, was discussing, but it's that kind of new thinking trying to go beyond the legal restrictions that uh, exist. Now, hearing your comments, I am um, you know, reminded of this intrinsic but perhaps not insurmountable tension that exists between the necessity to curtail certain forms of speech and the imperative to protect it, right? It's a tension that spares autocracies, but that is inherent in a democratic society like Estonia. And uh, just synthesizing one thing that uh, Andrea was saying earlier, because you, Andrea, you were discussing the uh, uh, cooperation voluntarily of the private sector. Mm -hmm. This tension, of course, comes to the fore when the private sector is not so willing to cooperate, and we know from experience that that can happen. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the uh, 2015 contention between Apple and the FBI. Yes. That was not a free speech issue, but it related to uh, privacy and the decryption 
of uh, a personal device of a uh, terrorist, right? So I'm wondering if, um, mindful of that larger tension, I'm wondering if you could say something about how to manage it in situations where, uh, for example, the large multinational uh, social media companies might not be so cooperative in curtailing activities within their forums. Yeah, thank you for a great question. I think it's definitely a problem uh, uh, how to restrict uh, freedom of expressions, but also to respe respect it. And uh, regarding uh, big social media platforms, in le at least with what we can see in this uh, Ukraine crisis is that uh, Google, for example, has been very cooperative with us. But um, in a long term view, I think that uh, we have legal challenges in front of us in the European uh, Union level, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, some legal, uh, some new legal acts that might help with us. But um, I think that the, what we can see right now is that the social media platforms are also thinking about this problem and they are very cooperative with the governments. And I think it's just a uh, question of time where we can find a solution, but it will take time, and we are prepared to work on that. Uh, well, we researchers will be watching you very closely. Uh, so by my clock, we started two minutes late, so I'm going to take the liberty as moderator to take us over by two minutes, which gives us four minutes for questions. My name is Dhruv, uh, UK private sector cyber security technology provider. Uh, my question is for the Assistant uh, Attorney General. In the two examples you had where the emails were compromised and so on, what took it over, over the line for your office uh, from considering these just as an acceptable level of espionage? Yes. Um... The, the two examples I gave, by that, the two examples I gave where we took proactive measures, uh, Hafnium and Cyclops Blink were the two uh, that I highlighted. Um, so look, I mean, the, in, in both of those cases, there was potential for significant disruption to uh, a wide range of private sector actors. Um, the, the, the extent of the, of, uh, with the Hafnium, uh, it was, which was China, Ch Chinese intelligence actors, um, Cyclops Blink, which was Russian military intelligence. Um, these were not what, what we would consider to be traditional espionage. Um, these were, uh, they, they had the uh, potential to be disruptive to a wide swath of, of our private sector, including critical infrastructure uh, within the United States. So there, I don't think there was a difficult question about whether or not there was something to, to be tolerated here. And even in the context of what some might consider to be traditional espionage, when we're talking about um, cyber attacks that put at risk critical infrastructure or involve uh, large amounts of personal data of US citizens from our perspective, um, we're going to be aggressive in, in investigating, prosecuting, as well as taking proactive measures where those are available. So we have time for one more question, so long as the questioner cooperates. Yeah, over here. Thank you, Pirat Pernik, CCD, COE. And uh, my question is actually follow on uh, for the previous one. And I was wondering uh, uh, that um, my understanding is that um, in both of these uh, takedowns that actually FBI accessed infrastructure located on the US soil. But um, for example, if it's uh, Joint Task Force Ares, uh, operation against ISIL, it was on the German soil, as well as uh, the previous operation, or actually, uh, <laughs> not previous, but later operation um, against in uh, internet research agency in Russian soil. So in this case, um, you wouldn't need a court order. You would have other uh, legislation um, that authorizes those actions, but uh, how do you actually convey this to the global uh, audience that uh, mm. US follows the uh, responsible state uh, action and, and this is a, a different case if you um, 
uh, interfere with infrastructure. Uh, do, do you understand what I mean? <laughs> I, I think so. I mean, this is a really it was a really important part of uh, with the recent uh, uh, measures that we took with regard to the Cyclops Blink. Uh, malware, uh, because that was, like all of these cyber attacks are not going to be limited to one country just by their nature, um, and when it, we're talking about nation states. And so with respect to the, the Russian intelligence botnet, uh, when we took out the command and control layer, that was done in close partnership with other countries that were facing, where we were able to identify um, command and control servers in other countries the FBI, with its partners uh, in Europe and other places, uh, reached out and had conversations, uh, as well as at intelligence agencies, to alert those countries so that they could take action under their laws as necessary. But there was close cooperation on a multilateral basis uh, to ensure that this was effective, because without that level of multilateral cooperation, of course, it would be much less effective. So it's a really important question. And, and maybe we can have just a brief comment from Andrea and Helen regarding the international dimensions of uh, your efforts. Uh, it's pivotal. I mean, uh, the, it's, it is quite obvious that this, uh, they, this type of crimes uh, don't have borders, don't respect borders. Right. So it's uh, essentially, we, uh, at, I think at European level, we have, we have de developed very legal tools, for example, the joint investigative team, because uh, uh, obviously using MLAT is a very slow process. Right. I mean, so multilateral cooperation is essential. We, de we, de we develop a, a fantastic cooperation with the FBI, which is essential for us. And for example, uh, quite lately we, um, we manage an operation, international level, also in Italy, on the use of the uh, dark web to spread the terrorist propaganda. And for example, with, uh, we, uh, in order to overcome the obstacles to cooperation due, uh, with MLAT, uh, using by MLAT, we, uh, we, with, the, with the FBI, for example, we conduct parallel investigations yes. and we exchange uh, information at the uh, police level. And then at the end of the operation, we, we can uh, then, uh, I mean, uh, formally ask the, the use of this evidence in uh, the respective police. So, I mean, I think, this is a field in which uh, really uh, a lot of uh, improvements in uh, these uh, in late years have, have been done. I mean, in terms of the level of cooperation, obviously more more must be also yes. done. Yeah. And uh, Helen, yeah, from thought? our side, I think uh, talking about the websites, what we did was to restrict access from Estonia to those websites. Mm -hmm. That can be done. But uh, regarding uh, cooperation between states, I think it, uh, in an EU level at least, we have a great example of uh, uh, giving sanctions uh, against those um, media outlets coming from, uh, coming from Russia. Therefore, I think the sanctions is one way, but we need to find some kind of a good solution on how to actually restrict access to the source. And if it's from another state, for example, in this case, from Russia, how can we do this from the EU or from the from US side? Yeah. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, usually at a conference like this, given the enormous challenges of addressing foreign cyber threats, I usually try to uh, uh, stem any soaring optimism that might arise. But I think that in the last hour, we've, given, we've been given some basis for it, uh, discussions about and illustrations of how government institutions can indeed adapt themselves and mobilize the legal arsenal uh, to this end. So please join me in th uh, thanking our three speakers, uh, Matt, Andrea, and Helen, and also uh, Davide uh, Giovanelli, uh, Giovanelli and Tatana Janczarkova for their indispensable support.